Good morning, church. Al, thank you for leading our communion thoughts this morning and uh, really taking us to the cross. That's a good place to be when you're thinking about fear. I, I, I want to tell you a little bit about the title of this series, Fear Less, uh, but before I do that, I'm going to ask you to do something I don't normally do because usually after I tell you to do this, you end up not listening to the rest of the sermon, but I need you to get your phone out for like 30 seconds. Get your phone out. What I want you to do is there's a number on the screen, and I'd like you to text something you're afraid of to that number. It's anonymous. We won't know who you are. A few reasons we're wanting to do this. One is, as I develop this series and, and teach and preach through this series, I want to make sure that over the next few weeks the kinds of things I'm talking about match up with the things that we are actually afraid of collectively as a body. And then secondly, I won't be able to cover everything that we're afraid of. And so we're actually trying to develop a, a resource page specifically so you can go there and, and find something that you and others in the room are afraid of. And then we're going to have some resources and other things that you can um, look at based on that particular fear. So get your phone out, please. And just text this number something you're afraid of. If you're sitting next to your kids, they don't have a phone, ask them what they're afraid of. You can text them multiple answers. And, and I want to hear from all, all age groups. So teens, I want to hear from you what you're afraid of. College students want to hear from you. Middle-aged, elderly, I, I want to hear from all ages. In fact, I haven't done this yet, so I'm going to do it right along with you. I'm going to stop talking for like 30 seconds here. Okay, you, you can finish that up. I appreciate you doing that. Let me, let me talk about the title real quick, Fearless. Fear is not always a bad thing. Fear is what makes you drive a little slower when the roads are icy. Fear is what keeps a toddler from running into the street when the toddler hears their mom yell at them. Uh, fear is what keeps you from making a bad financial decision, buying something that you can't afford. Fear is what keeps you from getting into a relationship you know it's probably not a good relationship because you see the warning signs. And so fear isn't necessarily a bad thing all the time. It's, it's part of who we are and we use it to our advantage. In fact, if you could just wake up tomorrow and, and not have that instinct, you wouldn't do that. Because if you had no fear ever, you would get into really, really bad spots, do dangerous things, and probably hurt yourself. So you need some fear. But on the other hand, there are some kinds of fear which we really wish we didn't have at all. The constant fear of failure, like we could do without that one. Or the fear of, of being irrelevant, just waking up and thinking, does my life even matter? Does, does anybody really care that I exist? Well, yeah, that's a fear that I wish that we didn't have to deal with. You see, there's, there's some fears that, that they plague us, that they paralyze us, and we wish they would go away. We fear being left out. We fear the mole on the back. We fear the bully at school. We fear the loss of control. We fear the agenda of the other political party. We fear the distorted ethics of our culture. We fear the ticking away of time. And we wish that we could just do away with those fears. And so here's the big idea of, of the series. And this, this big idea actually comes from two sources. But I'll, I'll tell you the big idea. That, the big idea is this. You can't actually be fearless. But what you can do is fear less. Now this comes from two sources. One is prolific author and speaker Andy Stanley. This is a great quote from him I actually heard a while back, but I, I find this very liberating. It's the idea that the goal is not to wake up tomorrow morning and be fearless. That's not reasonable. You can't really do that. But what you can do is tomorrow morning you can wake up and you can have less 
unhealthy fear than you did today. And then the next day you can have less fear and less fear and less fear. So you can't totally be fearless all the time, but what you can do is you can fear less. And so I think this next part's really cool because I, a few weeks ago I visited my grandmother, Betty Brookman, for the first time since the pandemic, and she was on lockdown. And I walk into her room and start talking to her, and she hands me this pile of papers, and she says, this is what I've been doing for the last nine months. And it's just page after page of, of Bible study notes. And so I take all these pages and start, I start reading through them, and then I come across one particular page, and I want you to see what she wrote in her own handwriting. She wrote this. Fearless isn't possible in our world, but fear space less, we can do this. So my grandmother Betty wrote that. So I think Andy Stanley is stealing from grandmother Betty. In fact, just to be an encouragement to her, because at some point she'll see this message, I'm going to count to three, and I just want everybody in the room to say, we love you, Betty. Here we go. One, two, three. Thank you. Get good grandson points for doing that. I appreciate you doing that. Now, the question then is, all right, I I get that, Phil. It's possible to fear less, but how do you do that? Well, I want to journey with Jesus today in in one of his great stories about fear, Matthew chapter 8. So Matthew, as a gospel writer, he, he uses the word follow more than any other gospel writer. Talks a lot about following Jesus. So at the beginning of his gospel, Jesus calls his disciples to follow Jesus. Then there's the Sermon on the Mount, and after the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 8 verse 1 says that large crowds are following Jesus, and they have good reason to. Jesus is healing the sick. He's teaching these incredible sermons. He's refuting the legalism of the Pharisees. He's bringing God's kingdom into the world. So Jesus is doing what people for a long time have have thought God's going to eventually do in the world. And so there's so much momentum surrounding Jesus. Everybody wants to follow Jesus. Well, here's what happens next. I find this verse so interesting. Matthew 8, verse 23. Then... He got into a boat, and his disciples followed him, which is what they're supposed to do. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake. Have you ever connected those two verses in your mind? The storm that comes on the lake immediately comes after the line they followed him. Like to me, it would actually make a little more sense if it were to say something like the disciples followed Jesus onto the boat. And then a rainbow appeared in the sky, and some seagulls flew over the lake, and some Galilean dolphins just swam by the boat. It just seems like a more pleasant picture, but the Bible's making a point here. When you follow Jesus, that is no guarantee that that you're not going to be caught in a storm. In fact, storms are the greatest teachers of God. And so if you're going to get in the boat with Jesus, expect to get drenched. Sometimes we think, well, if I just follow Jesus and just do the right thing, then surely my life is going to be easy. But that's not necessarily the case. In fact, I think Jesus takes them onto the boat so intentionally here because he wants to teach them a lesson. I, years ago, I was a ropes course assistant. And so my job was to get people harnessed up and help them through the course And there were some instructions that were given on the ground. And usually when the instructions were given on the ground, to be honest, people would sometimes listen, but sometimes they wouldn't. They'd talk to their friends. They had a lot of other things on their mind. One of my jobs was to sit three stories up on a platform. And as people got through the ropes course, I would help clip them into the grand finale, which was a zip line down to the ground. And let me tell you, when those people came up and I was clipping them onto this zip line, they were way more open to hearing about how to handle fear than they were on the ground. And for a lot of people that were scared, I was able to give them a few tips of how they could get down the zip line. But the, the, the point being, those people were much more able to learn about fear when they were in the presence of fear. And you're the same way, and and I'm the same way. We are much more apt to hear a word from God about 
fear when we're actually in the context of fear. And so whatever that is, what maybe it's a, a disease in your body, maybe, maybe you're in school and it's, it's the upcoming ACT and you're just, you're really scared about that. Maybe it's this relationship that you have and you're, and you're so afraid that it's going to go in the wrong direction. Whatever that is in your life, just know that you are in a master's class with the master. And he, he wants to teach you a lesson about fear. And so you want to be paying attention to that. Jesus leads, we follow, the storm comes. That's what Matthew 8 teaches. Jesus leads, we follow, the storm comes. Now, what, what, what exactly do you do in the storm and what, what do we learn about fear? I specifically want to give you four lessons from this text that we learn about fear. So, uh, verse 24, let's, let's get back into the, uh, the story here. Suddenly a, a furious storm came, came upon the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. So you can imagine this one in your mind. you got thick rain, whipping wind, deafening thunder, the boats lurching. And then we read about what I actually think is the greatest miracle in the Bible, or at least one of them, but Jesus was sleeping. And the reason I think this is so astonishing is because I am am a really, really bad sleeper. Like, I I, I don't sleep through birds chirping in the morning. Like, I, I wake up at anything... And then here you have Jesus, and he's taking a nap in the middle of a monsoon. And and just so we can get to know each other a little bit better, let me me ask you this. How many of you would say you're a good sleeper? Like, you can just, you're kind of like Jesus. That's good. And then how many of you say, kind of like me, you know, I'm not so good of a sleeper? Okay. So, for the first group, I guess you could use that to your advantage when you get in an argument. You could say, hey, I'm like Jesus. I'm I'm a good napper. Just something that you could say to someone. So Jesus falls asleep. He's on the boat. Storm's there. Verse 25, the disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. I really like Mark's version here, where Mark has the disciples saying, don't you care? Don't you care if we drown? So here's the first thing that fear does to us. Fear erodes our trust in the goodness of God. It erodes our trust in the goodness of God. So notice the disciples, they don't ask him about his power. They're not like, oh, Jesus, we believe that you're so powerful and we know that you're from God and you're going to calm this storm. Nor do they say, Jesus, is there anything you need us to do in the storm? What they actually do is they question his character. Which is odd because they know Jesus. Jesus has taught them. Jesus has nurtured them. Jesus has been with them. He has loved them. And yet in this moment, when they're stricken by fear, they can't help but question the character of the Son of God. That's what fear does. Fear will always erode your trust in the goodness of God. Here's the second thing that fear does. Fear deadens your spiritual memory. So the disciples, in the same chapter of Matthew, here's what's just happened. Jesus has healed this leper. He's gone out of his way to go into the this leper's world. He was willing to touch this unclean leper and heal the guy. Uh, Jesus then healed a, a Roman's uh, a, a child. And, and that was a really fascinating story because Jesus goes outside his main realm, which was the Jews, to actually serve and help and bless someone that most Jews would consider an enemy. And so Jesus is declaring that it's not just about one group of people. This is really about the whole world. And then also in chapter 8, Jesus goes to Peter's house and he heals Peter's mother-in-law. So over and over again, in the same chapter, Jesus is demonstrating that he has power over the physical world. And then they get into this boat and a storm comes and they forget that. Because that's what fear does. Fear, fear takes away those powerful spiritual memories that you and I have. You see, fear is the tyrant of the mind. Fear does not play well with others. In fact, when fear comes into your mind, guess who the first other emotions are to leave, or other things are virtues to leave? Gratitude leaves, joy leaves, love leaves, peace leaves, because fear just doesn't play nice with others. You see, when you're afraid of whatever it is in in your life, afraid of the unknown, afraid of failure, afraid of being left behind, whatever that is, when you're afraid, 
what you're not thinking about is the blessings of God or the people that God has put in your life that have really been meaningful to you over the years. You're not thinking about the victories that God has put in your life. Because when fear's in your mind, all those memories just go away just like they did for the disciples. And that's why so, mu- so many of the Psalms in the Old Testament are Psalms of remembrance. And the reason that is so is because fearful people are forgetful people. When we're afraid, we forget. And so spiritual memory is actually a really helpful spiritual practice. Like it's a good thing to sit around with people that you know and to talk about times in the past where you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God was with you. Because when you talk about those things, you remember them and then you feel this courage. Here's a third thing that that fear does to us when, when we let it take over. It releases the inner bully. In other words, you you become the version of yourself that you don't really like when you're afraid. Now, your bully probably doesn't come out all the time, and you probably actually wouldn't consider yourself a bully, but you probably have moments in your life where you say things that you shouldn't, and and maybe you, you, you post things that you regret a little while later. Well, it could be that the reason you're saying those things or doing those things is because you're afraid. I'm reading a book a, uh, it's a biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And there's an interesting character in that book. It's a minor character, but it's one of Bonhoeffer's allies. Bonhoeffer was the guy that around the time of World War II, he, he opposed Hitler. He's a great preacher, great writer. And he had a, a friend named Martin Niemöller, who was a German preacher. And Niemöller, along with Bonhoeffer, never really bought into this conflation of Christianity with Nazism that was formed this, this this, this horrible entity which then caused so much pain and death. And, and so Niemöller wasn't buying into that. And so early on, Niemöller goes to this church conference and a speaker is there by the name of Adolf Hitler. And this is way before, this is like 15 years before Hitler becomes the infamous Hitler that we all know about. He's just this up, up and coming politician. And Niemöller hears the speech and he stands in the back of the room. He doesn't ask any questions, but he goes home and he tells his wife one thing. Here's what he says. I discovered that Herr Hitler is a terribly frightened man. Well, that an interesting thought. And so like what drove Hitler to become this, this mass murderer? The thing that drove him there was fear. It was fear of losing control. It was fear of not having enough power. Now, again, you're not Hitler, but you and I, we do have this inner bully. And when when you're afraid, when you let the fear take over, you're going to end up saying things that you regret. Now, that's what fear does. Fear erodes your trust in the goodness of God. Fear deadens your spiritual memory. And fear releases your inner bully. So the question becomes, how do we fear less? Like, what do we do about this? Well, uh, let's read the next part of the story. So Jesus wakes up, calms the storm, and then everything becomes completely calm. And then he asks this question that really gets to the heart of things. He says in verse 26, why are you so afraid? In other words, what Jesus is getting at is he's saying, I'm here with you in the boat. But you're acting like I'm not here. So why are you afraid? See, the heart of the the issue here is when we are afraid, what we're doing is we're focusing much more on the something rather than the someone. And so the something in your life, it's, it's, it's the disease, or it's, it's the broken relationship, it's, it's the number of zeros on the medical bill, it's the, it's the upcoming test that you're studying for, but you just, you just feel like you just can't put in enough hours and you're afraid you're going to fail. Like, that's the something. But the someone is the man that said, I'm going to get in the boat with you. I'll endure the storm with you. I'll hear the deafening thunder with you. I'll witness the lightning with you. I'll I'll be with you and love you and die for you. He's right there. And so we all constantly have this choice to focus on the something or the someone. And when fear takes over, well, the only thing that's happening is that you're just focusing more on the something than you are the someone. 
You see, Christians are not unique in that we have storms. Christians are unique because of the one who weathers the storms with us. We have someone on the boat with us. Now, how do we actually do this? Like, I've, I love this text. I've preached on this text. It's a great passage about overcoming fear. But, but this particular reading, I, I, in my own mind, I was wondering, like, that makes sense. Focus on Jesus, not the thing that you're afraid of. But how do you really, really do that? In fact, well, I've never thought this about this text, but it just struck me like, what did Jesus expect them to really do? Like, I get it that he's calling them out. But like, if the story were rewritten, what would the positive example be? Like, I, I, obviously it's, good, it's a good thing that Scripture gives us examples of here's what's not to do, but I like when Scripture says here's what to do, and, and I replayed the story in my mind, and I was like, what, what are they supposed to do? Like, was Andrew just supposed to say, Thomas, this is a lovely storm, and yes, it's just I, I enjoy the, the, the rain in my face. Like, what? Like, that, did, that doesn't sound reasonable. It's like, what, what is the proper response to being in a storm? And then I'm writing this sermon, and it just strikes me, there is another great New Testament example of a storm happened 30 years later, about a thousand miles to the west. And the second storm was actually worse than the first storm. The second storm had a name. It was called the Nor'easter. And it it was given this name because there was this really strong wind which would come off a mountain on a certain island and, and the wind would go onto the sea and it would get up to 75 to 100 miles an hour. And there was a boat that got caught in that wind. And the Bible describes the wind as a wind of hurricane force. And there's a bunch of people on this boat and they can't sail out of the storm. And they try everything they can do on the boat to get out of the storm, but nothing works. And so finally they just take the sails down and they just let the storm carry them. And they get so despondent that they start throwing cargo overboard thinking that if the boat gets lighter maybe we'll get out of the storm but that doesn't work and so one day turns into two days and two days turns into three days and three days turns into six days and finally they're they're on the sea for 14 days everybody's depressed they're just waiting to die like some of you had to go through a 14-day quarantine this past year and you thought that was really bad and for many people it was and you know you have to sit in your living room and just binge on netflix and that gets old after a while but Can you imagine being on a boat with over 200 depressed people for 14 days and everybody realizes that they're all going to die and nobody's going to get to say goodbye to their family members? Like you talk about a storm. There's a prisoner on the boat. His name's Paul. He's got no positional authority. He doesn't have a bunch of sailing expertise to get them out of the storm. But what he does have is this remarkable amount of courage and what he does in this story is so like it's remarkable and I I think this is going to I hope this is the big takeaway as far as what we can do with our fear so Paul he's on the boat the worst of the depression is sinking in and look at what he does this is Acts chapter 27 verse 35 he took some bread he gave thanks to God in front of them all he broke it and they began to eat now, if you're just reading your Bible, you're probably just going to pass right over this as, as, as just a, you know, not that important of, of a line. But if you know the author Luke, it's a very important line because you, Luke uses these verbs in some other pretty critical places in the gospel story. Took bread, gave thanks, broke it. What does that make you think of? Took bread, gave thanks, broke it. Those are the exact same verbs that Luke uses in Luke 22 when Jesus takes the Last Supper with the disciples. They're the exact same verbs that, G- that Luke uses in Luke 24 when he breaks bread with the people on the road to Emmaus. So when these verbs come up, it's Luke's way of saying the presence of God has, has come in, into the world. And so Paul uses the same language and he's on a boat and he stands up and he says, we're going to take bread, we're going to give thanks, we're going to break it, and we're going to eat together. And so here's, here's the fourth lesson we learn about fear it's that fear cowers before practiced faith. Like as you think about how you're going to deal with fear in your life, like, like right now, today, this week, a lot of things, times what we will, what we will think is, well, if, if I can just get the right information in my head, I can beat this fear. In other words, we think, I'll just outthink the fear. But what I'm telling is you, you don't outthink fear. You out-church fear. 
This is why it is so important that we gather together and sing these songs and, and, and open the word and, and break the bread and, and take the fruit of the vine and just talk to each other in the hallways. And, and, and Lord willing, as we get out of this pandemic, we get back to the ability, to whether it's fist bump or shaking hands or hugging, like, like we were meant to be together. You don't outthink fear. You out church fear. This, this is the same reason why in, in former days long ago when, when, when slaves were trying to get through their, their days of tyranny and oppression and, and beatings, they didn't think their way through the day. They sang their way through the day. And there was something about practiced faith that enabled them to move forward in the middle of their storm as courageous people. And the same can be true of you and the same can be true of me. Our fears, they, they come to church to die. This is part of the reason we come to church. And so part of putting your faith into practice is reminding yourself and each other of the promises of God. So Paul, when he's on this boat, he, he spends a lot of time in prayer and he gets this word from the Lord that, that people aren't going to die. Like, ship's going to break apart, but they're going to make it. And so then Paul stands up in verse 25 and says this. He says, and again, this is 14 days into this. He says, keep up your courage, men, because I have faith in God. That it's going to happen just like he told me. Nevertheless, we must run around, run, agr run aground on some island. So what exactly is Paul doing now in, in his storm? And here's where I think it gets really interesting. Paul is doing in his storm... What the disciples did not do in theirs. Which is to focus on the someone over the something. And Paul's in the same storm as everybody else. But somehow, some way, Paul has learned to fix his attention on the presence of Jesus. And what makes this even more remarkable is that the disciples had the physical person of Jesus on the boat. And they were still terrified. Paul doesn't have the physical person of Jesus on the boat, but he has the presence of Jesus in his heart via the Holy Spirit. And he is so in tune with that Spirit that he is able to focus on the someone, Jesus, rather than the something. And then the coolest thing happens because courage is contagious. And so Paul stands up and says, we're going to make it. Yeah, the boat's going to break apart, but we're going to make it. And then other people start to realize, you know what, if he believes that, I believe that. And again, that's why church is so important. It's because sometimes you're going to say something to me that I need to hear. You're going to remind me of a promise of God that I needed to hear. This is why we come to church. And this is how we can weather our storms. You know, you might be petrified right now because you feel like you're in the hands of a brutal storm in your life. But maybe the promise of God that you need to hear this morning is that that storm is actually in the hands of God. And God is going to do what He promised. You see, God never promised to take us out of our storms. He promised to lead us through them. Because again, if you follow Jesus, you're going to get drenched. But while you're on the boat with Him, you have this choice to focus on the something or to focus on the someone. And I'm telling you, just like Paul, you have the ability to focus on the someone. And you might say, Phil, I, I just don't know if I can do that because my storm is really hard. And there's just no, there's, there doesn't seem to be any indication that it's going away. Like, how am I supposed to do this? Faith. That's why we call it faith. We believe. That God is who God says He is, and we believe that God will do what He's promised to do. You see, I, one thing that I, I believe is that if I had been on that boat, and I'd seen Paul stand up 14 days in and say, we're going to be fine, we're not going to die, I would have thought, Psh, sure. I would have thought, what a gullible, naive prisoner. And I would have waited until he got done with his speech and then I would have curled back up and probably wallowed in my fear again. But here's the thing that nobody could deny on the boat that day. Nobody could deny the fact that Paul had less fear 
than everybody else. You can't be fearless, but what you can do is fear less. And you've taken the first step this morning already just by coming to church. Because again, church is the place where fears go to die.